Hello and welcome to our Teams Academy training. In this session, we will be covering the dynamic emergency calling feature in Microsoft Teams. My name is Brian Nice. I am a principal program manager here in our Teams customer engineering team. Additional modules and trainings can be found through our Teams Academy page, which you can see at aka.ms forward slash Teams Academy. If you have feedback on this session, you can utilize the feedback links that we have on the middle of this slide. Teams and Office 365 are constantly evolving, so be sure to stay up to date utilizing our Teams blog link at aka.ms slash Teams blog. At the bottom of the slide shows the current version of this presentation. In this session, we're going to cover a couple of key learnings with regards to dynamic emergency calling. The first being that dynamic emergency calling provides the ability to configure and route emergency calls from Teams clients based on the known location of the user. This service is available for Teams, both with calling plans as well as direct routing deployments. So let's talk about the agenda for this training. First, we'll level set and discuss what dynamic emergency calling really is. Then we'll dig deep into how we configure the dynamic emergency calling process, and then close with a summary and set of additional resources. As an overview, when we talk about dynamic emergency calling, we're basically referring to the ability for Teams to route an emergency call based on the known location of the Teams client. Now, when we look at dynamic emergency calling, we have to look at it through the lens of how we are connecting the phone system to the public switch telephone network. If you are using calling plans, the call routing service for dynamic emergency calling is automatically included for you. If you are using direct routing, a direct routing environment must obtain an additional service through what are known as emergency routing service providers. You can see on the aka.ms link that we have on the page here who the current emergency routing service providers are. In addition to utilizing, utilizing emergency routing service providers, we in the direct routing deployments can also leverage what is known as ELIN or Emergency Location Identification Number Gateways. This is upcoming support as of this recording. You can always check that same aka.ms link to see the currently uh, listed ELIN gateway uh, options. Last but not least, we do have the ability to configure what are known as security desk notifications. This is an optional component, but will allow for the system to be able to bridge in a local security desk in the event that a user were to make an outbound emergency call. Now, as we break down calling plans versus direct routing, first I wanna start with some considerations around calling plans. When we talk about automatic routing of emergency calls, they're eventually routed to what is known as a PSAP or a public safety answering point. Now the automatic routing to these PSAPs is country dependent. So I'm gonna cover the countries that as of this recording, we currently have a service for calling plans in. We'll start first with the United States. Within the US, a client that has a tenant defined dynamic emergency location, which includes the geocodes, don't worry, I'll cover all the gory details in a little bit. In this instance, the call will automatically be routed to the appropriate PSAP. If the client is not located in a tenant defined dynamic emergency location, the call will be sent to a screening center or what is known as a national call center or an ECRC. This will allow the caller to talk to uh, the National Call Center to determine where the caller's location is, and then the call will be routed to the PSAP uh, based on that discussion. If for whatever reason the caller is unable to update their emergency location with the ECRC, then we'll simply transfer to the PSAP that is serving the caller's registered address. Now, outside of the US, the dynamic routing mechanism is not applicable. We don't utilize the dynamic routing components outside of the US. For uh, the countries listed uh, in the uh, slide here, there are different behaviors based on which country of origin uh, the call is, is uh, being made from. So for example, you have Canada, Ireland, UK. In this instance, the calls are routed to a tier one screening center, basically the same as the behavior in the US without a registered address. When we look at Germany, France, and Spain, the calls are routed directly to the PSAP that is serving the emergency address that's associated with the number. 
This is regardless of the location of the caller. That's why it's important when adding emergency locations for users in these locations, the address needs to map to the phone number that's based on the emergency address mapping in that particular region in Germany, France, and Spain. For the Netherlands, emergency calls are routed directly to the PSAP for the local area code of the number, again, regardless of the location of the caller. In Australia, emergency addresses are configured and routed by the carrier partner that we have in Australia. And finally, for Japan, emergency calling is currently not supported. You can see in the upper right, I have an AKA MS link that will take you to the latest version of uh, the information that you see on this particular slide. From a direct routing perspective, there are a couple of additional components that we need to be aware of as an IT pro or a tenant administrator. Um, we have to also, in addition to configuring the location information, we need to instruct teams how to properly route the emergency call. And we'll do this through a combination of definition of what we call a team's emergency number. This is effectively the number that the user will dial to reach emergency services. For example, in the US, this would be 911. Uh, we then also need to define what is known as a team's emergency call routing policy. And this will help us understand and enable uh, the routing of emergency calls based on the emergency number that was defined. Now I'm gonna cover each of those items in greater detail later in the presentation when we actually get into the configuration steps. But at this point, just realize that for direct routing, there are some additional configurations that the tenant administrator must provide. Now, what is location awareness? When we talk about location awareness, we're referring to what is known as LIS, L-I-S, which is the Location Information Service. LIS is used uh, to help us identify and populate the user's location within the team's client. The location awareness database or the LIS database will indeed affect the routing of emergency calls inside of the US uh, because this is what allows us to dynamically locate where a particular user is and then route the call automatically to the correct PSAP based on the location that is defined and validated in the list database itself. Let's take a look at the user experience for dynamic emergency calling. In this particular example, I'm looking at a user that is inside the US and has been configured with dynamic emergency routing. On the left-hand side here, I'm inside of the Teams application, inside of Settings, navigating down to the Calls section. And you'll notice here, as I look under Calls, I do have an emergency location defined for this particular user. This lets me know from an end user perspective that my location has been identified as, in this case, the Microsoft Irvine office here in Irvine, California. This information that is displayed here is the same information that the Teams client would be sending uh, through to the emergency services, uh, which would then allow us to get routed to an appropriate public safety answering point or PSAP. Now, in the second screenshot that I have here, this is actually a test call that I did from my demo client. Now, a couple of things I want you to notice here. First being, when I make the emergency call, you can see clearly in the Teams client that this is an emergency call with a nice big icon there. It also then shows for my information, here's the number at which you are calling from, and here is the location that we have identified for you. All of this is the information that will be transmitted up to the service for uh, the routing to the correct PSAP. Now, the other thing I want you to notice for the savvy people that have already seen this, down here at the bottom left, I'm actually dialing 933, right? That's not actually my emergency call, that's a test bot that allows me to test out my configuration without actually having to dial, in my case, 911 and invoke an actual emergency call. I don't wanna waste the time of my emergency services here, uh, but I do wanna make sure that it's properly configured. So dialing 933 in this case allows me to utilize the bot so that I ensure that I have the correct information being passed along to emergency services. The last screenshot that I have here shows the security desk notification. 
Um, in this particular screenshot, I'm doing simply what's called a notify only for the security desk, which basically means that when I placed this emergency call, we actually spun up a chat on the back end and included, this is my emergency services deal uh, that I've included here, my emergency services security desk, if you will. Um, and we can see from the chat message that's here that this particular user, Alex, placed an emergency call, and here's the address at which they placed the call from. And of course, date and timestamp are here um, as well. Now let's talk about how we configure dynamic emergency calling. There are four main pillars of configuration components that we need to consider when we go to configure dynamic emergency calling in Teams. The first component, and probably the most critical component in my mind right here, is known as the trusted IP address. Trusted IPs help us to identify corporate network connected clients. Now, we'll talk about how we do that in the next couple of slides, but without the configuration of trusted IPs, basically the rest of the stuff that's on this slide becomes irrelevant. Because if we don't realize, and again, we being the team service, if the team service doesn't realize that you are connected to a corporate network, that's what we use the trusted IPs for, then we're not going to bother to try to determine your address dynamically. You won't have any mechanism for Liz. You won't have any mechanism for emergency policy site assignments and so forth. None of the stuff that's to the right of this box is going to work if you don't properly define your trusted IPs. So that's step number one. Make sure that we get our trusted IPs defined. I'll show you how to do that coming up here in a minute. The second pillar that we look at is known as LIS or the Location, Inform uh, Location Information Service. Now, this is the ability for us to populate the uh, the database of known addresses and locations. Now, there's a couple of pieces that we're going to do here, right? There is, of course, the emergency address and location itself, also known as places. We'll see that coming up here in a bit. But this would be the street address, the city, state, zip code, if you're in the U.S., for, for example. Um, the list network identifiers allow us to get much more granular. Right. This piece that I'm highlighting right here, this is really the dynamic piece of the puzzle. Right. The list network identifiers allow us to get much more granular and identify which IP subnet a user might be connected to, which wireless access point a user might be connected to, and eventually which switch and or switch port a user might be connected to. Now, we'll talk more about how we configure lists coming up here, but the third pillar of configuration components has to do with what we call emergency policies. Now, emergency policies actually control two things. One, they control the ability to do service desk notifications. Now, again, if you're using calling plans or you're using direct routing, either way, you have the option of using service desk notifications. So if that is something of interest to you, fantastic, you can go ahead and configure that. If it's not something of interest to you, maybe your organization doesn't have a service desk, that's fine. This is an optional component to configure as well. The second item that I'm pointing to right here, the CS Teams call routing policy, this must be configured if you are using dynamic emergency calling together with direct routing. This is what is going to control and incorporate the routing of emergency calls for a direct routing deployment. So if you are doing direct routing and you're doing dynamic emergency calling, this one's not optional, right? You do need to make sure that you configure uh, CS Teams call routing policy, and I'll show you how to do that in a few slides. Now, the last pillar here talks about network configuration. The network configuration components that we talk about here allow us the opportunity to dynamically assign the emergency policies that we configured in the previous pillar. Right. So if I want to dynamically assign this service test notification or if I wanted to dynamically assign this call routing policy, I could configure that appropriately using this network configuration pillar. And that's where we would configure items like regions, sites, subnets. It's important to note, and I'll reinforce this as we go throughout this deck, the network configuration pillar that you see over here has absolutely nothing to do with the dynamic address components that are in lists over here. Okay, These dynamic uh, assignments here are specifically for the emergency policies that we cover here in this third pillar. 
So these regions, these sites, these subnets, they don't have anything to do with, you know, finding your user and sending this off to the PSAP, nothing to do with that. These network configuration items only have to do with the two items that you see in this third pillar. Now let's dig deeper and get into the configuration here, starting with arguably the most important piece, which is configuring your trusted IP addresses or trusted IPs. A trusted IP address is an internet external IP address. This is a public IPv4 or IPv6 address that is part of your enterprise network. This is the external IP address that would be exposed on your internet egress connection. So if I'm an end user on your internal network, when I egress out to the internet, I'm typically gonna get natted to some kind of public IP address that's gonna get me out into the internet. That public IP address is your trusted IP or is one of your trusted IPs. Now, typically, but not always, we will prefer IPv6 over IPv4, but when you are doing the configuration of trusted IPs, you need to enter both. So working with your network administration team, find out for your internet connections, what are your IPv4 and alternatively IPv6 uh, public IPs that you are using uh, for internet egress. This is used to determine if the Teams client is inside the corporate network. All right, remember, Teams is part of a cloud service. So to be able to connect to Teams, you have to be able to get out on the internet somewhere. At some point, you're going to get a public IP address, most likely through NAT. And we want to ensure that that is a public IP that your organization owns. Hence, it is trusted by you and is part of your uh, actual uh, corporate network deployment. This is checked before we look for any other matches with any of the other components that we talked about. So if you want to do lists, right, the dynamic lookup of a user, their civic address, location, their subnet, their switch port, the wireless access point, if you want to do any of that, or you want to do any of this dynamic policy assignment with the network configuration service, right, that fourth pillar of region site subnets, if you want to do any of those items, the first thing we have to do is match you to a trusted IP. If the, the Teams client isn't able to do that at the service, then we stop the processing and we don't bother checking any of the rest of these items. That's why the last bullet that's here is so critically important. You must match the client's advertised public IP address with your trusted IPs that are configured inside of the Teams admin center or you know, through the tenant remote PowerShell. So where do I go to create these things? Well, you can create them in Tenant Remote PowerShell if you so desire. Uh, that's the new CS Tenant Trusted IP Address commandlet, or you can utilize the Teams Admin Center to create these trusted IPs. Now, the trusted IPs aren't only used for Teams, uh, for dynamic emergency calling in Teams, I should say. They're also the same uh, trusted IPs that you would use if you have configured location-based routing, otherwise known as LBR. Um, they're also used for uh, the upcoming direct routing media optimization components. So there is a little bit of overlap in what these trusted IPs are used for. So you might already have some of these trusted IPs configured if you're using uh, components such as LBR. Now, an important thing to note, the network configuration service has a two hour cache. And what that means is if I go into the service, I go into tenant, uh, the, you know, the Teams Admin Center, and I create a new trusted IP, it could be up to two hours before I actually see that in the configuration, right? So don't be alarmed if you go and create it and then you go run a test and something doesn't work immediately after that. There is about a two hour cache buffer window to be aware of uh, with regards to the network configuration service. Uh, this has to do with anything with regards to NCS, right? In this case, we're talking about trusted IPs, but it could also be when we go and build regions, sites, and subnets, those are also part of NCS and would be subject to the two hour cache. Now, here's a visual representation of how we configure trusted IPs in the Teams Admin Center. Now, when I open the Teams Admin Center, I'm going to navigate under uh, locations on the left to the network topology blade. And from there, I'm going to click on the uh, tab here that will let me get to trusted IPs. Uh, from here, I can see my existing trusted IPs that I have configured. Uh, 
Uh, I can also go ahead and click on add and go ahead and add a new trusted IP by picking the correct IP version, entering the public IP address here, and then the appropriate network range. Uh, typically for an IPv4, if you're entering a single IP, you'll have a network range of 32. Uh, down here, we have a visual representation uh, just to uh, remind you what the purpose of the trusted external IP address is. Uh, when we are entering these trusted IPs, these should be public IPs, which are your uh, internet egress uh, or public NATed IPs that you will use to get out to the internet to reach the uh, Microsoft phone system. Next, we're going to talk about Location Information Service, or LIS. Now, the first step when we're working with LIS is to define our environment. And in this instance, we want to build out a hierarchy, and that hierarchy and information should be detailed enough to allow an emergency responder to easily locate a person. Now, as you see in this hierarchy, at the top of the hierarchy, we have a civic address. The civic address is generally referred to as one of your specific buildings that you may have on campus. Underneath that civic address, there are typically one or more locations, as you see here. These locations, uh, which are also called places in the uh, Teams Admin Center or in the UI, um, often would be, for example, a floor in that particular building. So if this is a building on my main campus, this might be the first floor, this uh, location over here might be the second floor. And then inside of those locations, again, from a hierarchical perspective, we could have one or more network elements that allow us to get much more granular with how we identify where a user is. That could be a simple IP subnet, that could be a wireless access point that the user is connected to, or it could be a switch and or switch port that the user uh, is connected to. The civic address is the top of the hierarchy. The civic address, of course, includes the street address, city, state, zip for us here in the United States, but it also includes geographic coordinates or what we call geo coordinates, latitude and longitude coordinates that are used to provide where the user's location is. Now, when you assign a number with our calling plans in the service, you are required to pick an emergency location for the user. This will be the default location that is assigned to the user, which means that even if you didn't do anything else that we talked about in this particular uh, training, you haven't defined anything in lists or any of the trusted IPs or any of that stuff, by virtue of you assigning a number with calling plans, you will have a default emergency location provided for that user. That ensures that, like we talked about earlier in the training, if we can't dynamically find the user, we'll fall back to whatever the default location is that's assigned to the user and route to the appropriate PSAP based on that information. The additional enhancement that we can do at this stage, as the last bullet mentions, is to use the LIS database or the LIS network components. Again, those are subnets, wireless access points, switches, ports, and so forth, use those network components to dynamically assign a more granular location. So it's not just that Brian is located at the Irvine office, a three park plaza in Irvine, California, but it's that he's actually on the 16th floor. Maybe it's he's actually connected to wireless access point three on the east end of the 16th floor, right? That lets me get much, much more specific so that in the event a uh, emergency responder needs to find me, they have a, a much more specific location to go to. Now, the creation of the initial civic address can be done through either the Teams Admin Center or through Tenant Remote PowerShell. I much prefer to do this through the Teams Admin Center because the Teams Admin Center can automatically fill in the geo coordinates for me. However, it is important to note that as of this recording, the creation of these civic addresses in the Teams Admin Center is restricted to only geographies in which we currently have calling plans. So if you're gonna be doing this for direct routing, you'll need to use Tenant Remote PowerShell for the time being. We are working to update the Teams Admin Center to be able to accommodate direct routing deployments as well and allow us to build our civic addresses through the Teams Admin Center for DR.
But have no fear, if you can't do it in Teams Admin Center or you just like PowerShell, you can do it through the new CS Online List Civic Address commandlet that I mentioned right here. Now there are a couple of parameters here, the dash latitude and dash longitude parameters. Um, if you're doing ELIN gateways, there's also a dash ELIN parameter that you can use. I'll show you what that looks like on the next slide uh, coming up here. Um, but you can provide the latitude and longitude as part of this PowerShell command line as well. And for example, you could go out to Bing Maps, like you see on the right side there, and gather your uh, lat and long coordinates uh, from Bing Maps and then place that into uh, the CS Online List Civic Address command line. Now, once we uh, validate, and again, this is done upon creation and is done automatically, uh, we can no longer edit the civic address. So if you put the civic address in, once it's validated, and then you go, oh, I didn't mean to put that address in. I just need to edit the name of it or what have you. Yeah, we can't edit it. We have to delete it and recreate it with the updated information that we would want to use. So make sure that you're... Um, clear on the fact that once we create and validate these, we don't have any option to edit them uh, after the fact. Here's a couple of screenshots of the civic address creation through the Teams Admin Center. Now in the screenshot on the left, you can see that I'm adding a new location for my Irvine office in California. You can see that I've placed the address in and we've automatically filled out for me the latitude and longitude. Now you notice I do have this toggle here for edit the address manually. It is set to off. If I were to toggle this to on, you can see that the options down here light up. And this is useful if I needed to fill in information such as ELIN, which is the emergency location identification number. I could fill that ELIN information in here. Now, once I click save, that will validate this address and then I will no longer be able to come back and edit this. So again, if I were to simply follow the screenshot on the left here and then click save and then go, oh, I needed to go put the ELIN information in. I can't go back and edit it to put the ELIN information in. I need to go and remove this and re-add the location. Keep in mind too that once you assign this location to a user, you can't delete it <laughs> without creating a new address, uh, a civic address, and assigning the new one to the user so that you can then delete the old one, right? If you want to delete a civic address, it cannot be assigned to a user. Now, going down the hierarchy, right? The civic address is the top of the food chain, if you will, when we look at the hierarchy. The next layer down are what we call locations, also known as places, right? Now, by default, when we create a civic address, we get a corresponding location automatically created for us. But in a lot of instances, we want to get a little bit more granular than that. So in my example, I don't just want the Irvine office in uh, California. Maybe I want to get more granular and create an additional location like a floor on the building or uh, a quadrant in the building or what have you, right? So. The administrator can go ahead and create additional locations and map those locations to that civic address. So I could pick multiple floors and I could even further subdivide that if I so desire um, and build those as additional locations inside of and associated with that corresponding civic address. Again, this can be done both in the admin center as well as tenant remote PowerShell. In the admin center, we simply go under the locations. Uh, blade to emergency addresses we will select our civic address and then move to places and that's where we can go and build all we need to, to build there i'll show you a screenshot of that coming up or you can do it through tenant remote powershell using the new cs online list location commandlet and again you'll reference the associated civic address id to map the two together right because it's a hierarchy um, if you don't know what that civic address ID is, which I mean, most folks don't, <laughs> you're going to use get CS online list civic address to find the correct civic address ID so that you can pipe that into the new CS online list location commandlet. Now to create a place in the Teams Admin Center, I'm first going to navigate on the left hand side here underneath locations to emergency addresses. And here I will actually see the list of emergency addresses that I currently have configured. Uh, these are my civic addresses, remember, right? So here I can see I've highlighted my one civic address, which is Microsoft CA Irvine, and I'm gonna click on edit for this civic address. This will bring me to a window that will allow me to configure 
places that are associated with this civic address. Now notice, you know, I can't actually edit this information that's here because it's been validated, right? This civic address, once it's validated, we don't have the ability to edit it, but I can come into here and I can add additional places. So I've already done this in the example here, but you would simply click add, and then you can type in a named place that you would like to use for this location. In this instance, I've created a new place known as building three, floor 16. If you want to achieve the same thing in PowerShell, you can do so by utilizing a series of uh, commandlets that are shown on the slide here. Now, this set of commandlets actually does two things. It creates a new civic address and then creates two places that are associated with that civic address. So first I set up some variables here, right? I'm using this first variable to make sure that I have my number format correct with my uh, de decimal separators. Um, I'm including my latitude and longitude for this particular location. And then I begin to define my civic address, right? So here I'm holding inside of this uh, variable, the new CS online list civic address. And this is all the information that I would need to provide for a new civic address. This includes latitude, which I'm passing in with my variable here, as well as longitude, which I'm passing in with my variable here. I'm then running the test CS online list civic address commandlet and passing in the civic address ID of that civic address I just created to test and validate this new civic address that I've created. Once that civic address has been created, I'm coming down here and I'm adding two new locations or two new places to that specific civic address. And I'm doing that as two different floors, right? You can see here that I've defined the second floor and I've defined the third floor. And I've associated both of those with the main civic address via its civic address ID. Now, once I've gone ahead and created these new civic addresses slash locations, I can then assign those statically to a user. Now, remember, when you go to assign a phone number to a user with calling plans, at the time you assign the phone number, you must assign an emergency location. Now, again, that could be just simply a civic address with the default location, or it could be your custom one uh, that you've built. So what I'm showing in my screenshot here from my user, Alex, if I go to the number that I've assigned to him down here under emergency location, you can see search by city, I can bring up Irvine, and there is the civic address that I created. And this that I have highlighted here is the new location that I have assigned or created, I should say, for that user. So I'm gonna go ahead and select that. And what this does is it now sets the uh, static location for this user, Alex, to be building three, floor 16 of the validated address, Microsoft CA Irvine, which you can see here is three part plaza. Now, that's all very manual, right? I mean, if Alex were to change floors, this wouldn't automatically be reflected here, right? This is just the manual way of assigning a uh, an address. And this is important because if you do nothing else that we've configured or talk about in this deck, we still need to be able to route an emergency call for a user that's configured with calling plans. That's why we do this initial step. If you don't configure anything else, this is what we will use to make the decision to route to the PSAP or the public safety answering point. But of course, you're not here just to do that. The training that we're covering here talks about the dynamic side of things. So how do we make it so that if Alex were to move floors, this would be reflected appropriately? We'll do that by dynamically assigning locations. Dynamic location assignment is done through lists, location information services, the list elements that we use to dynamically assign the location to the team's client. Now, we have three different categories that we can work in. The first and most common that I see is the IP subnet. The IP subnet that you can define is the network subnet ID for the user's uh, machine. And this must match the client computed root network ID based on the client's IP insider notation. Meaning, if I put in a subnet, of 192.168.1.0, that's the subnet ID. 
I have to make sure that the user, when they get an IP address from DHCP, it's 192.168.1. something slash 24, because that insider notation would be the 192.168.1.0 subnet. They have to match. If you don't, and you just say, ah, well, I'll just put in 192.0.0.0, and that'll catch everything, right? No, it won't, because when the client computes his subnet, He's not on the 192.0.0.0 subnet. He's on the 192.168.1.0 subnet. So they have to make sure that those match. You'll do this through the set CS online list subnet commandlet. And here's the kicker. If you are going to be defining these subnets, they have to be unique within the tenant. Maybe subnets not going to work for you. I've had examples with uh, large universities where their entire campus is using the same IP address range, right? It's a big old public IP address can, uh, range in some instances. So they're, they're like, well, identifying by subnet doesn't help me because I don't know where they are, but it's a wireless campus. So maybe that leads us to the second category that we can use, which is the wireless access point BSSID, right? The BSSID would be entered in the form of a MAC address. This is the actual MAC address that the uh, client sees when he's connected to the wireless access point. So it's usually in the format of uh, either dashes or colons, right? It, again, it depends on what the client sees. I've given you a screenshot of what my test client sees here. And you can see when I use this netsh command, the BSSID that I see, and of course I've masked out uh, to protect the innocent, um, you can see that my BSSID is shown with the uh, colon rather than the dashes. So I would want to, when I define this wireless access point, I would want to define it exactly the way the client sees it. We'll use the set CS online list wireless access point commandlet, and then we'll associate that uh, to the location with our location ID. I'll show you how to do this coming up here in a bit. The third one um, is a, uh, a series of network switch and port configurations that you can do, but we don't yet have support for this yet. Um, ideally, what's going to happen here is the client and switches would utilize LLDP, uh, actually LLDP-MED um, is what they would use to be able to communicate back and forth with um, what switch and or what switch port I'm connected to. Um, currently, we don't support this. We are working on support for the Windows platform, which will be coming uh, very soon. Um, but right now, while you could go and configure this, it's not officially supported to use network switch and port yet for dynamic assignment of locations. Now let's talk about the emergency policies that we can configure. Remember that there are two different emergency policies we can configure. The first that we're going to talk through is the security desk notification. This applies to both calling plans as well as direct routing deployments. They're both capable of utilizing the security desk notification. You'll configure security desk notification through tenant remote PowerShell, utilizing the commandlet that you see here, which is the CS Teams emergency calling policy commandlet, but you can also configure this through the Teams admin center. Now there's a few things that you're gonna to want to know when you go to configure the security desk notification. The first is what mode do we wanna use? When a user dials an emergency number and we notify the security desk, the first option is to use the notification mode of notification only. In this instance, we'll simply create a Teams chat. And that chat will go to all members of the predefined notification group. And I'll show you how to set that up in a sec. The predefined notification group and the chat contains all the gory detail of who made the call and what address they called from and so forth. Refer back earlier to the screenshot that I did in this presentation back at the beginning of the Teams client. You'll see that first example that I gave uh, showcases the uh, notification mode of notification only for Security Desk. Now, the second option and third option here are tightly coupled, right? It's the idea of it being a conference, right? So now when the user dials this emergency number, we bridge in, as we call it, or we conference in the Security Desk and they can either be conference muted or conference unmuted. If we choose conference muted, all members of that notification group get added into this emergency call, but they are in a muted state. So it's a listen, 
only, right? So of course the person that called the emergency number can talk, the dispatch on the other end can talk, but the security desk is in a listen only mode. Conference unmuted means that everybody gets added to the call. Uh, they would be in an unmuted state at that point. So they would be able to talk and interact. They can't mute themselves either. Um, and again, that's for the purposes of ensuring that if needed, they can talk to um, the emergency personnel as needed from the security desk side of things. The notification group parameter, this is the mail enabled security group or the distribution list that you want notified of the emergency call. Right, so when we talked about this notification mode here and we say all members of the notification group, yeah, that's the one that we define right here. And then this third option is notification dial out number. Uh, this is an E164 formatted phone number that can also be notified of the emergency call. Right, so this could be that not only do I want to bridge in my security desk of people that are using Teams, but I also want to have this number called which maybe is also a security desk number, but perhaps they're not a Teams user, right? Maybe it's a, an external number that we're gonna have them call. Once we configure this, we can assign it, either of course using the global, which I mean, we don't have to assign that, it just gets inherited. We could assign it to an individual user using this grant CS Teams emergency calling policy, or we could assign it to a network configuration site, which I'm going to cover when we get into the, um, uh, the dynamic section of security desk policies and emergency policies. And again, we do have the option to configure this in the Teams Admin Center as well. The emergency call routing policy is applicable to direct routing only. So if you're not doing direct routing, you don't need to worry about configuring this emergency call routing policy, right? But if you are doing direct routing, and uh, you are utilizing this dynamic emergency calling, you must configure the following items. First, you must configure what is known as the emergency number. This is effectively the phone number that the user is going to call to reach emergency services. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, I didn't configure emergency numbers with calling plans. Where did I do that? You didn't have to do that because that's automatically taken care of by the service. But with direct routing, now it's up to the IT administrator or the tenant admin to make sure that we configure the proper phone number to use for direct routing. So first we'll configure the emergency number. Again, we can use either PowerShell, there's the new CS Teams emergency number commandlet, or you can do it in Teams Admin Center. You'll configure what is called the emergency dial string. So this is the actual number that they call, the user would call for emergency services. So for the US, that would be 911. In other countries, you know, like in Europe, it's 112, right? This is the actual number that they dial. An optional thing that you can configure here, though, is what's called an emergency dial mask. This is a semicolon separated list of other phone numbers that would be translated into the emergency number specified in the emergency dial string. Now, an example of this might be, you know, perhaps you've built these policies appropriately, um, but you have a user from Europe that travels over to a location in the US. And that user is so used to dialing 112 that they do it. They have an emergency and they simply dial 112. Well, you could build an emergency dial mask that says, oh, well, if the user traveled into a site inside of the US and they happen to dial 112, that's our emergency dial mask that will change to 911 for them and shoot it out appropriately. Because obviously if they're in the US, we don't want them to dial 112, but if they're in the middle of you know, having an emergency, they may not be thinking, oh yeah, that's right, I'm in the US, I should dial 911. Uh, the last and most important piece of what we configure here is the online PSTN usage. This is the usage that we're going to use for the actual routing of the emergency call. So you're going to configure, you as the tenant administrator are going to configure an online voice route to tell us which SBC, which session border controller should we use, which gateway should we use to route this call? Well, the online PSTN usage is the glue between the emergency number that a user dials and the gateway that we have to send the call through. Now, in addition to configuring the emergency number, the tenant admin must also configure an emergency call routing policy. Now the call routing policy 
ties the defined emergency number that we had in the previous slide to a particular PSTN usage. We'll do this again, either through PowerShell, the new CS Teams Emergency Call Routing Policy Commandlet, as noted here, or also through Teams Admin Center. And when we get a little bit further in the presentation, I'll show you the visual of what this looks like. You'll then say in this call routing policy, what are the emergency numbers that we use? This will be an array of emergency numbers that we'll uh, pipe in to this emergency call routing policy. If you're not a PowerShell geek, that probably just went over your head, the whole array thing. Um, that means it's probably going to be easier for you to use the Teams Admin Center um, for this, but I'll take you through both anyway. The next option is the Allow Enhanced Emergency Services. This is important because this controls whether the feature is enabled and whether we treat it as an emergency call. So if you forget to turn this on, yeah, we don't really treat it as an emergency call. So you need to make sure that we allow enhanced emergency services for this. This call routing policy can then be individually assigned to a user uh, through this grant commandlet that we have here, or it can be through network site discovery, which I'm going to cover in the next section. The last piece of the configuration puzzle that the tenant administrator needs to do is ensure that the PSTN gateway that's defined, right, that represents the SBC or the session border controller that we use for direct routing, we need to ensure that the trunk is enabled for emergency calling. And we do that by making a minor change with set CS online PSTN gateway, and we turn on this option called PITIF low, right, PITIF low supported true. Right, that's going to allow us to then send the uh, location information, the dynamic location information across the trunk to the emergency services provider uh, that we're using with direct routing. Here's an example of what the security desk notification looks like with the conference muted option. So again, I did a quick test here with my bot, my 933 bot. And when I, as the user, made the call to this 933 bot, it automatically created a bridge, which included myself that was making the call, Adele down here, she was a member of the group uh, that got brought into the call, and this is actually a dial out number that I included as well to ensure that that external number could get bridged in uh, to the emergency call. So there you see the conference that's automatically established when that particular user uh, made the emergency call. Now that we've configured our emergency policies, let's talk about how we can dynamically assign those emergency policies. Let's start with a scenario. Our company, Contoso, has corporate offices in the New York, New York area, as well as the Los Angeles, California area. Each office has their own respective security desk or service desk. We have a user, Alice, and she is based in the New York office. So when she's in New York and she dials emergency services, which would be 911 uh, here in the US, that should cause the New York service desk to be notified. If Alice were to travel to the Los Angeles office because she has really bad luck, she has to dial emergency services again. It's the same number, 911, but in this instance, I want to make sure that the Los Angeles service desk is notified because she's now traveled into the Los Angeles office and not the New York service desk. So how do we make that a reality? Well, this would be done through the dynamic assignment of emergency policies. So to support this scenario, the tenant administrator needs to configure the appropriate network configuration elements and then assign that configured or pre-configured policies to a network site. Now, remember when we look at tenant network configuration, there's really three components here. There's the network region, there's the network site, and there's the network subnet. That's all kind of in a hierarchy, right? Subnets are placed within a site, sites are attached to a region. Well, when we go to apply these policies, the only place that we can assign an emergency policy is either at the site level or the user level. In this case, a site policy would always take precedence over a user assigned policy. 
This might seem a little contradictory, uh, but that is how it behaves. If you assign a policy at a site level and we determine that the user is in that site, that policy will override any individual user policy, uh, user emergency policy that we've assigned. Now, if there's no match, so we can't find what site they're in or there isn't a policy assigned at the site that they're in and there isn't a user policy assigned, we'll revert back to the global policy that is configured. It's also critically important to note when we talk about dynamic assignment in this context, these are tenant network components. These are not used for the mapping of emergency addresses for users. This has nothing to do with the address that I you know, send off and make a decision for what PSAP I talk to. Nothing to do with that. The only thing these components have to deal with is the dynamic assignment of emergency policies, the dynamic assignment of emergency routing, location-based routing, and direct routing media optimization. That's what these tenant network components are for. Okay, so don't confuse these with lists, right? Remember the four pillars that we talked about before of configuring this. This is pillar number four, right? Pillar four, the dynamic assignment of the items we configured in pillar three, which were our emergency policies. Regions, sites, and subnets. A network region interconnects various parts of a network across multiple geographic areas. And by definition, a network region is typically a collection of network sites. The network site itself will represent a location where the org has a physical presence. And the network site is typically a collection then of unique IP subnets. As such, as we go down the hierarchy, right, the network subnets are internal IPv4, IPv6 subnets that get associated with and assigned to the various network sites. IP4 will take precedence in this instance over IP6. Multiple subnets can be associated with the same network site, but multiple sites cannot be associated with the same subnet, right? So you have to keep that in mind as you're building out this uh, network hierarchy. Remember, we did mention this earlier, but it's worth revisiting here that the network configuration service does have a two hour cache. So newly created items like these regions, sites and subnets may not be available for up to two hours post creation. This tenant network configuration is completely optional for dynamic 911 or emergency services, right? This is only used for the dynamic assignment of policies, emergency calling policies, emergency call routing policies. That's it, based on the user's network site. This is not used for emergency address lookups, right? This has nothing to do with LIS or the location information service. The subnet maps the client IP address to a defined network site, and the subnets must be unique. Okay, let's put it all together here and look at this from a user configuration perspective. So let's look at our user requirements. We'll do a quick recap here. First and foremost, you may be wondering, does this work with Skype for Business? And the answer here is, no, <laughs> Skype for Business calling plan users are not supported for dynamic emergency services. The static emergency calling is still available, right? So when you go and assign a phone number to a user, you still have to give them a location. That still works for the routing of emergency calls. You just can't extend the dynamic piece of it to Skype for Business. For Teams, we do support both calling plans as well as direct routing. Now for calling plan users, we need a civic address and a location, and that needs to be validated. The civic address needs to be defined with the proper geo coordinates. That's the latitude and longitude. Very easy to do with the Teams Admin Center, right? To do the dynamic components, we need lists. That's the ability for us to go in and configure the items you see here, subnet, switch and port eventually wireless access points, right? They need to be defined for the client location. They need to be assigned to the location and to the associated civic address. You have to have trusted IP addresses configured. 
If you don't do trusted IP addresses, nothing else works. So make sure you get your trusted IPs configured. And then optionally, for our calling plan users, we could configure the emergency uh, calling policy for security desk notifications. And we could then configure the corresponding network elements if we wanted to dynamically assign that emergency calling policy, which we would use for security desk notifications. For direct routing users, there's a few extra steps we have to look at, right? A lot of these are still the same, right? We need the civic address and location. It needs to be defined with the geo coordinates. We need lists, right? Subnet, switch, port, WAP, trusted IP. All of that is still the same for direct routing users. But in addition, the team's emergency call routing policy for 911 needs to be defined. That includes turning on this allow enhanced emergency services that then needs to be granted to a user or it needs to be granted to a defined site for that user. In addition to um, the call routing policy that's here, uh, the emergency calling policy needs to be defined and granted. And again, that's based on how we want to do our security desk notification. Um, online voice routing policy and routes need to be defined, right? So how do we actually route the call? I'll show you how to do that in a couple slides here. For direct routing, you do need to make sure you have the additional call routing service, right? The additional um, service that's provided by our service providers in, uh, in DR. Uh, the link that you see here, aka.ms slash DR dash SBC, will give you the latest and greatest on the currently uh, supported uh, service providers. And then optionally, like we said before, you can configure the security desk notifications and the network elements for the dynamic assignment of the uh, calling policies as well as the call routing policies. So let's take a look. Specifically, we're going to look at the DR side of the house, right? So if I'm going to do online voice routing for my direct routing users. If I'm going to do it in PowerShell, right? I need to build a usage like I did here, set CS online PSTN usage, and boom, there's my usage. I need to define an emergency number, right? I'm going to store this in a variable because when I pass this along in PowerShell, I have to pass it as an array. I'm going to show you that here in a sec, right? So here's my variable, dollar sign en, new emergency number. My dial string is 911. My usage is, in this case, US 911. I'm not doing any kind of dial mask here. I'm just keeping it simple, right? So this defines my emergency number and stores it in the variable. And then I define the emergency core routing policy. New CS Teams Emergency Call Routing Policy. I'm going to call this the US 911 policy. Here's where I pass the array. Dash emergency numbers at add, and there's the array of emergency numbers, which I already stored in my variable. And then super critical, right? Allow enhanced emergency services is set to true. If you're not a PowerShell person, you're kind of like, yeah, dude, I'm not going to do that. That's cool. We can do it through the Teams Admin Center as well. Right underneath the voice, go to emergency policies. Up here is the tab for call routing policies. Right, remember call routing policies are specific to direct routing only. So from here, I can click add, give it the same name. Right, again, I'm just doing this in the admin center as opposed to doing it in PowerShell. You obviously wouldn't create the same thing twice, but if I were to do this in the admin center, I would give it the name US 911. There's enhanced emergency services. I toggle that to on, right? That's the same as this dollar sign true option you see here. Here's where I can set up my dial string and my mask. And then I can actually type in the PSTN usage here, or if it already exists, I can just click this manage PSTN usage records and it'll allow me to go and add whatever usages I want. So it's a lot easier to do it through the Teams uh, admin center, unless you're you know, pretty savvy on the PowerShell side of things. Another component we need to do on the DR side is make sure that we add the appropriate voice route. Now, this is something we need to do in PowerShell, and it's achieved through the new CS online voice route command. Right here, you can see with new CS online voice route, I'm giving it a route of US 911 for 911 dialing. Online PSTN gateway list. This is the session border controller or the gateway that I want my emergency calls to go through. And then this is the number pattern that I want to match, 
The number pattern here that I want to match is 911. And this little plus question mark here, right, means that you may or may not see the plus sign, right? And I mentioned that here as a, as a call out. But it's a good idea to get in practice of making the route include this plus question mark because back in the Skype for Business days, we required the plus to be there, but, but Teams doesn't. So if the user happens to send 911 without the plus, we want to make sure the call is still routed accordingly. Right. And then here, online PSTN usages, that's the linkage of the PSTN usage from the previous slide when I was, you know, building that uh, particular call routing policy. The DR user doesn't have to have an online voice routing policy that includes this usage assigned to them. Right. The cool thing about it is as long as um, this is properly defined, the emergency call will be routed using the online PSTN usage directly. Now, remember, when we configured uh, the security desk notification, there was an option for us to bridge in an external number, right? Um, in that instance, any external PSTN call used in that security desk notification needs to use the user's online voice routing policy, right? So um, if, if you decide to put an international number in there and that user can't call international, that could be bad. So just make sure that if you're going to include the option of um, adding an external entity in that security desk notification, that the user's online voice routing policy is able to appropriately route that. If you wanted to build that security desk notification in the GUI or in the Teams Admin Center, um, here's how we would do it. Right. Well, first off, we can just use global if we don't really care about dynamic assignment. And again, if your org is small enough, maybe you only have one security center and everybody can call the same one. That's great. But if you're like the example I gave earlier with Contoso, where they have a New York office and they have a uh, Los Angeles office and we want to make sure the right one gets notified at the right place. Well, then I might need to create additional uh, calling policies for this security desk notification. As always, we can do it in PowerShell. Teams emergency policy, uh, calling policy, notification group, that's the uh, email address of the uh, security uh, group, uh, email enabled security group or the DL that we wanna send to, and then the notification mode, right? Notify only, conference muted, conference unmuted. Or if you're a Teams admin center kind of guy, go under uh, voice, emergency policies, go to the calling policies tab. Now remember, calling policies here, these are for both calling plans and DR because this is just about security desks, right? Click add, right? There's global if I want to use that, but I can build a new one. Click add, click whatever name and put in whatever name you want here. Here's where I set the notification mode. Here's where I can set that dial out number, right? That's the same as uh, we saw earlier uh, in the example where I had the, uh, the user dial the emergency services and reach out to an external number. And then here you specify the DL that you want. So in this case, I already have an emergency notification distribution list created. The dynamic assignment of these emergency policies follows the following logic. First, if we don't do anything, we'll follow the global settings that are available, right? And that's with get or set CS Teams emergency calling policy or call routing policy, or you could do it through the you know, Teams admin center as well. You can then take these policies and assign them per user statically, right? And again, here's our PowerShell commands to do it with the grant commandlets, um, or we can go to the Teams admin center go to the calling policy, and then you can assign that to individual users from there. That's the static way of doing things, right? You can also do it the dynamic way, which is by site. Now, of course, to be able to do this, we have to configure the network configuration components, right? The regions, sites, and subnets. You can do that through PowerShell. I'll show you an example of a, a fun one of that coming up here. You can do it through the Teams Admin Center going into locations, the network topology, and you can build out that network topology there. This is the same place you went to define your trusted IPs, right? Remember that the dynamic, the site configurations take precedence over user assigned policy. So if we match the user's network location to one of these sites, we're gonna take that policy as opposed to one that you might have assigned directly to the user. So here's the visual representation of the tenant network elements. If we look on the slide here, you can see if I go to locations, network topology, I can see the network sites that are listed. Now, I do already have a site here, which is the New York site, but I'm going to go ahead and click add and show you what it looks like when we add a new site. 
So when I go to add a new site, of course, I can come here and choose to define the site by name, place whatever description I like. And then from here, I can choose to link this to the appropriate network region. Now, of course, if you already have the network regions defined in the topology, you can select it here. Otherwise, you can just click link network region, type in the region name, and away you go. Uh, for the purposes of my uh, environment, this network region uh, is US. Now, I'm not using location-based routing, so that's off. We don't need to worry about that. But these two options that are here, the emergency calling policy, the emergency call routing policy. Uh, the emergency calling policy, this is where we configure the security desk notification. Uh, this is where I uh, could then choose which particular uh, security desk notification policy I would like mapped to this particular network site. And likewise, over here is my emergency call routing policy. Uh, this is the usage to use based on the defined emergency number. Um, and I could have this allocated to this particular network site as well. Down here, you can see where we can add our subnets. Now, remember, when we're talking about subnets in this context, this is where you define IP subnets that are specifically used for the dynamic application of these emergency policies. Uh, this is used by location-based routing. This is used by uh, the DR media optimization. These are not used for location information services. So again, these have nothing to do with the uh, dynamic um, assignment of a location for the purposes of routing an emergency call. Now here, I'll show you a completed one. This is my New York site. Right. Uh, you notice here that I have my network region set to US. Of course, as I mentioned before, I'm not using location based routing for this example. Um, and again, as I uh, had alluded to earlier with my scenario, uh, I wanted to ensure that the security desk notification that I configured would route to the security desk inside of New York. So I have selected an emergency calling policy of US NY. 911, this is my calling policy that will route to the security desk in New York. Likewise, if I were to configure my Los Angeles site, I would change this drop down to point to my Los Angeles calling policy to make sure that it notifies the correct uh, security desk for that location. Uh, as far as the call routing policy is concerned, I'm simply using my standard US 911 because all of my US calls are going to route uh, to the same place, so they're essentially going to use the same usage. And then here at the bottom, you can see that I have uh, configured my two subnets for this particular site and mapped them to the respective floors. Now, if we continue on with the scenario and we want to create the uh, second site, which was Los Angeles, I can show you how to do that uh, using PowerShell. Now, in this particular example uh, here, my first uh, option that I have in PowerShell shows me creating the uh, network region, which I already have. But I mean, if you were to follow this through from a logistics perspective in PowerShell, I would define my network region. So in this case, there's my new network region of US. Uh, I define the site here, which is Los Angeles, and I map this site using this $NR.NetworkRegion ID. That maps the site that I just created back to this particular region. And then I define my two subnets, as you see here, right? There's my subnet identities. Uh, I put my mask, I put my description that these are second and third floor, and then I map them to $NSite1.NetworkSite ID, and that's what maps these two particular subnets back into the site that I created. And to kind of wrap things up, here's a visual uh, representation of the last few slides that we covered with regards to the dynamic emergency policy assignment and the routing uh, of these calls through uh, direct routing. So if I look here on the left side, uh, this is my defined region, right, which I have of US. And inside of the US, I've defined two sites, I've defined New York and Los Angeles. And then inside of those respective sites, I've built out the respective subnets that you see here. Now, I have assigned to the New York site, if we follow down the line here, an emergency call routing policy of US 911 and an emergency calling policy of US NY 911. Remember that this calling policy is what handles the service desk notification, whereas this call routing policy uh, takes care of the, emer the, the defined emergency number and the corresponding PSTN usage that will handle the routing uh, of the emergency call. Over here, you see at my Los Angeles site, right, you'll notice that the call routing policy is the same because I'm routing my calls the same way um, inside of the US for emergency routing. Uh, but I have changed the assignment of the emergency calling policy to be a US-LA 
911. This ensures that my security desk notification goes to the Los Angeles security desk and not to the New York one, right? And that way, if a user were to travel from New York to LA, their client machine would get an address in this 10.20 range, depending on, of course, what floor they were on. That would map them to the LA site. That would give them this emergency calling policy. And when they make the emergency call, fantastic. It lets my security desk in Los Angeles know about the call. Now, the last part of this uh, on the right side here shows the actual voice uh, or the call routing policy combined with the voice routing policy that we created. So this outer box here, right? This is the emergency call routing policy, right? Of US 911. And inside of that, I defined the emergency number of 911. I also created and defined a PSTN usage. And in this case, my PSTN usage is named US 911. This usage is the glue that interconnects this call routing policy together with the voice route that I've created. And here you can see in the voice route, that's where I've defined the number pattern. And in this case, I'm matching the 911 with or without the plus. My gateway list here is just simply sbc1.contoso.com. This points to that gateway, which has a trunk, of course, which goes to the session border controller. That trunk is configured with CS online PSTN gateway, and I have enabled Pitaflow supported true. So when a user dials the emergency number of 911 um, through the assigned emergency call routing policy, we're linking that to this voice, uh, to this PSTN usage, which links to this route, which has us connect over to this gateway. And we're able to then send the call out to the attached um, service provider here that will then be able to fulfill the uh, dynamic E911 call. From a supportability standpoint, clients, we need to be aware that not every single client that connects to Teams is supported for dynamic emergency calling. Of course, we support the desktop clients, desktop Mac, desktop Windows. We do support Android and iOS mobile clients. Uh, the client store versions are listed on this slide here. Teams certified phones are in fact supported. Teams room systems are on the roadmap very shortly to support the dynamic component. Of course, they can still call 911, but the actual dynamic component uh, will be coming shortly as part of the roadmap. There is a set of unsupported clients, though, to be aware of, right? The Teams browser is not a supported client because there is no mechanism in WebRTC for us to be able to get the location. And any Skype for Business clients uh, that might be connecting. So the Skype for Business, you know, mobile clients, uh, Skype for Business desktop clients. I mean, that's obvious because we don't support this with Skype for Business at all. But we also don't support this on the third party IP phones. Right. And that is a scenario where you might have a Skype for Business three pip phone or a third party IP phone connecting to a team's environment. In that instance, those devices do not support dynamic uh, emergency calling. One last note, emergency calling uh, or emergency calls will actually block call forwarding. So if I have call forwarding configured and then I make an emergency call, we will automatically block call forwarding for two hours from the time of uh, the user making that emergency call. This is uh, by design to ensure that we allow a callback from emergency personnel to reach the right party. Right. Think about if I had set up call forwarding to a colleague of mine and then I call emergency services. And as I'm trying to say something to them, I pass out uh, or I or I lose my connection or whatever. And they try to call me back and then the call gets routed to my colleague. And they yeah, I, I don't know what happened. Right. We want to make sure that we block that scenario and ensure that that emergency call back makes it to the right person. Also note that emergency calls generally are not included in call history. So you're not gonna go to your call history and see when you have made an emergency call. All right, so our key learnings here, dynamic emergency calling provides the ability to configure and route emergency calls based on known locations of the user. It is available for teams with calling plans as well as teams with direct routing. Thank you for your time and attention. We look forward to seeing you at one of our future events.